Dr. Uh, Valentina Kupak, uh, who is the founder CEO of Optimum. Uh, I welcome her uh, to this uh, session. Thank you for uh, taking your time and presenting this uh, talk to us. She's a double graduate. Uh, she uh, received her uh, back in 2011. Uh, she graduated from University of Sydney uh, in both Bachelor of Science as well as uh, Bachelor of Commerce. And since then, she has been in the industry for more than 10 years. Uh, her uh, early on in the career, she has been a very active hands on developer working with uh, like C Sharp, Java, .NET, C++ and various other languages. More recently, she is uh, uh, a technical consultant and a technical coach for companies uh, involved in software design and development. And as part of this, uh, she started this company Optimum. So what they do or what she does is primarily help these companies to adopt uh, TDD style of uh, development, adopt a clean architecture or principles of clean coding. And these are the things uh, and also it's like a change of mindset. You know, when you go to any company which has a lot of legacy products or trying to get in uh, start a new project, uh, the developers also need a change of mindset uh, going from their old ways of working towards TDD. So those are some of the things that she tackles as well when working with teams uh, in the in in their effort to improve their software quality. So with that uh, short introduction, I now uh, pass it on to Valentina. If you want to add a little bit more about Optimum and uh, yourself, uh, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. So first of all, thanks a lot for the introduction. I'm really happy um, to be here today. So uh, this topic is, I think, a really important uh, topic. Um, Basically, the topic is TDD versus um, TLD, and we will be looking at the differences in terms of the feedback loops. So a short intro, since I've already been uh, uh, introduced, the only additional thing I want to mention is I am writing the regular articles about test-driven development and clean architecture. So feel free to connect with me or uh, follow me, so both Twitter and LinkedIn. Now, the agenda for today. Uh, first of all, we will be looking at the question of why do we even write tests and the relationship of seeing tests as executable uh, specifications. Then we will look at the difference between writing tests uh, before or after code and writing it incrementally versus in batches. We will look at the difference in feedback loops between test-driven development and test-last development. So what's the difference between writing tests before code or writing tests after code? Uh, we will look at code coverage and some common misconceptions. Sometimes people think they can write tests afterwards and then just compensate this later with increasing code coverage, but I will show that that actually uh, uh, is not the case. It can't help us increase test suit uh, quality. And uh, the other also thing that we will be looking at is uh, mutation testing. And basically, the, uh, ha the its impact on the test suit quality. First of all, why tests? Let's say we don't have any tests. This means our requirements are purely written in on paper, Jira, or some other tool in a natural human language. Now, the problem is that these requirements might not be clear, uh, might not be testable. That's a simple consequence of writing something in, in human language. They are definitely not executable. And the problem is that these requirements easily become outdated. We have no idea whether what we write on Jira or Confluence will get updated or will it not get updated. Now with tests, our requirements become testable and executable. So what happens is we take uh, requirements and we write them in machine language. So instead of human language, we write it in machine language through tests. So tests are basically uh, example-based 
requirement specifications. These tests are clear because they are examples. Um, these requirements are executable and they are always up to date, unlike Gyro or Confluence, which don't remain up to date. Uh, the other also important point about tests is continuous integration. Uh, as part of definition of continuous integration or CI, we need a self-testing build. Now, in order to get this self-testing build, we need self-testing code. So that implies uh, automated tests. And you can read more about it on the Martin Fowler uh, website. Basically, if a team does not have tests, then they can't have continuous integration. That's the important point. Now we move on to the topic of when do we write tests? Do we write tests before or after code? Uh, do we write it incrementally or in batches? So when do we write tests? We can write it before code. We can write it tests after code. Uh, we can write it incrementally, so this means test code in little pieces, or we can move in bigger steps, batch, so for example, batch-based test first. Similarly, when we write tests after code, we can do it incrementally, which means a bit of code and then a bit of test and then a code test, or it can be in batches. Or the worst case scenario, never. It means we start off with wanting to write tests, but we actually uh, never write them. Uh, so then in the subsequent slides, we will comp be comparing these. So first of all, what is test-driven development? Uh, the TDD cycle starts off with the red. We write a failing test, and this is a falsifiable test. Then we write just enough code to pass the test. So we're focusing on working code. Then we can refactor the code to get cleaner code and still confirm that our test passes. So this is the basic TDD cycle. And this is incremental because we start with one failing test, write the code to pass, and we can refactor the code. Then we move on to the next test. So each of these tests is essentially a small increment. Uh, we can see basically TDD is both incremental and iterative. I mean, it's iterative because we can further refine behavior through these uh, increments. And basically, that's the cycle that we're repeating. We write a test, write some code, refactor, and check that the test passes, and basically keep on repeating this. Uh, another thing you can also look up is test commit uh, revert, uh, which is just a more stricter form of TDD uh, and basically uh, more focusing on when, when someone does commits as well. Now moving on to the next one, uh, test first, first but in batches. So batch, it's much a bigger, like a really big increment. This means someone writes a whole series of many failing tests. Then they write a lot of code to make the tests pass. And then they can refactor the code. And then we go on to the next batch. And here's the problem. Sometimes people think that this is TDD. Well, it's actually not TDD. I mean, TDD is purely uh, uh, incremental. This one, we can call it batch-based test-first uh, development and just to avoid confusing this with TED because this is not incremental. We can then move on to incremental test-last development. Uh, this means with each increment, we write some code, we write some test, and then we refactor. Again, write some code, write the test for that code, and then refactor. This is similar to TDD, but notice there's no red test, red step. We never actually see the test failing. Now, there's actually a bit of a problem with that. Without the red step, 
we never see our test fail, so we can have false negatives. So this means uh, uh, that the test itself is invalid. It, it always passes. And these kind of tests actually can't detect bugs properly. So this means we have a problem here with uh, incremental test class development. Now, we have an even bigger problem with batch test class development. This means someone writes a lot of code for a feature, then they write all the tests, get the tests to pass, then do refactoring, and then move on to the next batch. So here, it was basically uh, the implementation of a whole feature and then writing tests right at the end. Finally, we have test never development. I mean, that's a name which I perhaps made up. I'm not, not sure if it's explicitly named anywhere. But what happens is teams who adopt test last development, so they plan to write tests after the code, but they say we don't have enough time for testing, or some developers say, well, I don't think I should write a test for this. Or maybe they say it's too painful to write a test. So then the testing, writing tests gets delayed and ultimately the tests are never written. So this is the worst case scenario about test last development. Uh, let's now analyze the differences in feedback loops between TDD versus TLD. The first feedback we get is requirement testability. Can we even write a test for the requirement? If we can't write a test for the requirement, this means the requirement is not clear. So we have to go back to the product owner and get clarification to understand the requirement. The next uh, feedback that TDD provides is test falsifiability. Like, do we see the test fail? Uh, this helps us have assurance that we have an actual valid, valid test. Uh, next, it provides us with feed feedback about interface design. So, since we're writing tests for code which does not exist, we have to start off with interface for the code, and the test is our first consumer. So, we're actually getting a feedback about is, our, is the interface of the code user-friendly? Then we get impl impl uh, feedback about implementation correctness. Does the code work like does it satisfy uh, the expectation set in the test so we get a green if that passes and finally refactoring safety so does the code still work after uh, refactoring uh, so looking at the in a picture-based way we start off with a, with a requirement a general requirement, we translate the requirement into examples, and these examples are our tests. So here we get the feedback whether the requirement is testable, is the test falsifiable, and is the interface consumer friendly. So we actually get free feedback types just from the red step. Then we write some minimalist code to make the test pass, and we get feedback with the green. Does the implementation actually work? And finally, we can refactor the code and get feedback that refactoring didn't break the implementation. So at the end, we've gotten to uh, clean code, and we have confirmation that it uh, still works. So minimalist clean code. Uh, let's contrast this with test last development. Oh, uh, also just forgot to mention, so basically here we can see that we have a really, really uh, short feedback loop from the requirement to get the actual code working and then to get it clean. Now, if we contrast this with test last development, it will look uh, like a much bigger picture. So. In test last, we take a requirement, we write some code, we perhaps do manually manual debugging, and we write the test. 
but we might discover problems in writing the test that our code is not testable. So then we have to rework our test, test and code. And we can all already see that in this first step that we're getting, that it's much longer feedback loop. But the thing is, we never saw the red. We don't know is our test actually falsifiable, is our test valid? So we would have to comment out the code in order to be sure that the test is, is actually valid and then uncomment out the code. Now, of course, no one does this, but this is what someone would need to do if they want test class to be equivalent uh, to, to test-driven development. And finally, we can do refactoring. So what's the problem here? Uh, here we can basically see the TLD, test class development, has much longer feedback loops compared to uh, test uh, driven development. And these longer feedback loops, they are basically, um, uh, how shall I say, possibly also increasing uh, development time and also the developer might go in the wrong direction and basically waste time. Next, what's the difference in debugging when we compare TDD versus TLD? So test-driven development is incremental. We're moving in really small steps and debugging becomes almost obsolete. Um, now in incremental TLD, since we never see the test failing, uh, when we have a problem, we don't know is the problem with the test or with the code. So there's actually more debugging involved. In batch-based TLD, this means you write a whole big uh, feature and then tests at the end, you have a much larger chunk of code before doing any tests. So many things could have been gone wrong, a lot of debugging, and then the worst case scenario in TLD of never writing the tests at all, it means we have to do extensive debugging on a regular basis because we don't have any tests at all. The next topic is uh, code coverage. So some developers, many developers might think, okay, we will just, you know, write a test class and at the end we will simply add tests at the end, look at the code coverage number, when it reaches 100, great, we've reached the same thing, it's the same as CDD, but actually it's not. So we will discover how, why, why this is uh, a misleading um, belief. So let's look at the test suits in test-driven development versus test last development. We want to, to look at whether uh, our tests are covering or not covering certain behavioral expectations. So an expectation that someone has of how the program should behave. Uh, in test-driven development, you have a certain test suit and over time the test suit grows but as it grows we can be sure that it's covering the behavioral expectations simply because the developer had to write the expectation before writing the code but in test last development we start getting these holes which here are illustrated in gray so these are test holes this means a developer had implemented a certain behavioral expectation in code, but did not implement that expectation uh, within the tests. Uh, why does this occur? Maybe a developer is under time pressure, so then they say, well, I don't have time to write the test. Or they might say, mm, I don't want to write the test, like this is too, too simple. Or even if a developer tries their best and wants to write the tests, since they never see the test fail, they can't avoid false negatives. So this means they, they might have a, a bad test, I mean, a test which is simply always passing and not able to detect bugs. Uh, 
uh, high code coverage does not itself imply high test quality. So basically, code coverage metrics are a good negative indicator, but a bad positive indicator. So this means if you've got a low code coverage, okay, it's telling you you have a problem. But just because you have a high code coverage, it does not mean you have a high quality test suit. And you can read more about this in um, Vladimir's book, uh, Unit Testing uh, Principles, uh, Practices, Patterns. Let's look at now uh, the common metrics, code coverage and branch coverage. So suppose you need to have um, to implement some function which has some simple logic. For example, is the temperature uh, greater than 30 degrees Celsius? If yes, it's hot, else it's cold. We could write it in uh, one line with a conditional ternary operator, or we can write it as multiple if-else statements over uh, multiple lines. And let's say our test is exercising uh, one branch only. In the case of code coverage, it's actually sensitive to the lines. So if everything's written in one line, even though only one branch is being exercised, the code coverage is 100%. But if it's over multiple lines, then we get uh, a lower code coverage, whereas only branch coverage is able to to detect that we've only tested one branch. So we see a problem here. We see the problem that code coverage is dependent on lines of code. So this means just by changing the number of lines of code, our metric changes even though the behavior is the same. In this sense, branch coverage is a better metric compared to code coverage because it's focusing on control structures rather than the number of lines. Now, what happens if we have a test with no assertions, but we're exercising both branches of the logic? Uh, these coverage metrics will both yield 100% coverage, even though there's no uh, assertions. So this means that coverage metrics are only providing us with feedback about how much of the code is exercised, but not whether the outcomes are verified. So we can have zero assertions, but yet 100% coverage. And this kind of test is, well, close to useless. And let's just compare the difference in terms of how we see TDD uh, versus um, TLD. So in TDD, the high uh, coverage is just a side effect. We don't chase it. Because in TDD, we write these uh, um, example-based requirement specifications, the test, before we implement the specifications through code. So this means we naturally get high code coverage. We don't aim for it. It just comes but in TLD, we typically may have very uh, low code coverage, and then people are just trying to retroactively add tests to, to increase code coverage. But the problem is that even if you get high code coverage, you still can't guarantee test suit quality. The reason is code coverage is about code execution, and that's a very small, small part of test suit quality. The much bigger part needs assurance about uh, behavioral expectations. Are we verifying expected behaviors uh, through our tests? And basically, code coverage can't help us with this. So that's why code coverage is, we can't say high code coverage means high test quality when code coverage is just a small part of the bigger picture. Uh, next, uh, we move on to the final part of this presentation, which is the test suit quality and uh, usage of mutation testing to help us with this. 
So mutation testing is about testing the tests. So what's the quality? Um, maybe if someone could go on mute, please. Or I will press the mute button. Okay. Uh, I will continue on. Okay. So mutation testing is about the quality level of our test suit. Basically, if we modify the code behavior, are the tests able to detect this? Uh, so these, if you use any um, anything which, which helps you for mutation, any tool for mutation testing, it will basically try to mutate the code in little bits and see whether your test is actually, whether a test is failing due to that modification. If the test fails, this is good. We have a high quality test suit. But if the tests still pass, then we have a low uh, quality test suit. So this is where mutation testing is able to provide us with feedback which we're not able to get through uh, code coverage metrics. Uh, basically, this is where mutation testing can help us to handle holes in our uh, test suit. Code coverage can only tell us whether parts of code were executed, but mutation testing can help us discover the missed expectation assertions. Basically, if code is mutated and the test still passes, this means we either have some kind of missing test which we need to add or we need to modify an existing test by adding missing assertions to destroy the mutants. And that's where we can have higher confidence that um, uh, our tests, um, test suit has high quality. And now when we compare again TDD versus TLD. So in TDD, tests are added before the code. We naturally get high code coverage. We get a high, a good mutation score because there's basically zero or very few mutants in the in the case of mutation testing. In the case of TLD, tests may be added after the code. We have to retroactively chase code coverage. The problem is just because we have a good code coverage, is that it does not mean that the, we have a quality test suit. In fact, we might be uh, not asserting the right things, so we can get a low mutation score and have to uh, and have many surviving uh, mutants. And this is where, as you know, high effort in TLD in two ways. We have to retroactively add tests to get higher code coverage, and we have to destroy many surviving mutants. So this is the high effort someone needs to do in test class development to achieve what they could have achieved with test-driven development. So just to summarize, basically, test-driven development has shorter feedback loops. It guarantees that uh, ex behavioral implant, uh, expectations, which we implemented in code, that those expectations are covered by tests. And we get naturally a higher quality test suit. TLD has test class development has longer feedback loops. It does not guarantee that uh, the implemented behavioral expectations are covered by tests. And we also get uh, a lower quality test suit due to uh, a higher probability of holes in our test suit. And in the worst case, test loss degrades into test never development, basically resulting in a code base with no tests or significant gaps in our tests. And this also means um, that there's no continuous integration. So basically, I hope that this has illustrated um, in a, a short way the differences between test-driven development versus test class development and its impact on feedback loops. So I just want to say uh, thanks a lot to, uh, to everyone. Uh, you can
connect with me or follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter if you want to learn more about test-driven uh, development and uh, clean architecture. So now I will be available, uh, looking forward to your questions. And I will just switch off screen sharing now. Yeah, you, uh, Valentina, thanks a lot for this uh, session, very nice session. You mentioned about one particular book in the middle of that uh, presentation. Could you please repeat that? What? Uh... Uh, I think it's one second. I might sh uh, turn on screen sharing again. One second, just to go a bit in regarding those uh, books. One second. Meanwhile, I'll just mention that uh, this recording will be available on our YouTube channel. So you can check the slides later as well. Yes, so I think I was mentioning the book regarding code coverage. Uh, the book is um, by Vladimir Korikov and it's uh, unit testing principles, uh, practices, patterns. Uh, I highly recommend that book. Um, basically, the focus in that book, uh, he firstly started off with ex explaining these, you know, issues with code coverage and why it's not not a good measure of um, test suite quality. And later, most of the book is focused on um, how to write high quality unit tests. So unit tests, which are basically coupled to behavior to the API of code rather than being coupled to uh, implementation details. So it's definitely uh, a really good read. Sure, thank you very much. You're welcome. And yeah, for uh, in terms of uh, other possibilities that, that we could discuss, I mean, I'm not sure if there's any other questions that the people have, but also maybe experiences sharing like how are people currently working with team in their teams where they test driven development, test last development, or uh, are people facing any challenges or setbacks from their team? Yeah. So uh, there is a question, I think, from Igal Ore. Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, Valentina, for excellent presentation. Um, uh, in your uh, in your explanation, you you make an uh, a vision from technical point of view where the goal is to achieve uh, uh, most coverage uh, of the code. Uh, but most of the business users do not see it as a goal himself. How do you translate? There uh, some evident uh, things uh, from technical point of view. How do you transfer it for the business users that there is a necessity for uh, to 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 reach high uh, code coverage to reach uh, uh, to avoid those holes? Mm -hmm. Okay, Th this is an excellent uh, excellent question because I think that's the biggest setback that's faced in uh, companies whereby even maybe some developers. Uh, might want to do TDD but or or test automation in, in whatever way, but the managers might say, oh, this will just be uh, additional time, we, we don't need it. Uh, to put it this way, if business wants assurance that something works, then there's only two possibilities to get that assurance. Either they will get that assurance in an automated way, through tests, or they will get that assurance with uh, manual QA. So the options are either a high level of uh, automated testing and some exploratory manual testing, but no manual regression testing, or a company chooses manual regression testing and not test automation or something in between that they do uh, some automation, but small amount and then still have to rely on manual QA. Uh, what's the problem there? Uh, the problem there is that uh, company will need to just hire more and more manual QA engineers to do repetitive cost work 
what could have been automated. So that's actually an additional cost. Uh, that company uh, can't achieve continuous integration because if you don't have a self-testing build, you, you don't have continuous uh, integration. So that company will then have to have much longer release cycles and they can fall behind in terms of their competitors. They can also suffer reputation problems, like when their customers complain that something's not, not working, which could have been avoided. Because the whole point of test-driven development is essentially if business has a certain requirement, let's write that requirement in, in executable form and write code to satisfy that, that, that requirement. So it's assurance. If someone blows away that assurance, then they, the only alternative is manual QA, which is in the long term much costlier costly option and um, basically uh, the company will face reputation issues with its with the customers. So I'm not sure, did that uh, answer uh, your question or, or was there um, something else which which you challenge you faced but which I didn't maybe handle in the answer? I think it mostly answering, but uh, unfortunately, um, that uh, the the it does not represent in the moment that uh, as an architect you present bef uh, in between of business users, you have to provide the cost, uh, how much it will cost, and in that way, retrospective, uh, a lot of uh, user uh, business users are reticent to spend now to reduce spending later. They prefer uh, yes. to 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 spend on mm -hmm. something else to introduce more features, more fe uh, uh, more possibilities in the product than release maybe less but more stable features. And uh, answering that balance, even for startups, it's not a, it's not an easy question. Uh, yes, definitely that that's a good point. But I have one more one more additional comparison. To even release one feature, like right now, in the next few days, a developer might have to, if there's no tests, they would have to manually uh, debug the program. And for example, writing a unit testing for something which might take, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds or something short. If developer has to, for example, start up the whole application five times during the day, they've already already gone over the time limit. But uh, again, uh, it it is it is more difficult uh, for for management to understand this. However, based on your question, uh, I do plan maybe to write some a future follow up post about maybe a more quantitative comparison or illustrated in a in a clearer way for, for business people. I think it's, it's a great, th thanks a lot for, for raising this topic. I will be waiting for it, thank you. Thanks a lot. We might have a question from Bharti Ponnambalam. Bharti, are you there? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for this uh, demo and it was really wonderful. And my question here is, I have never done a D, uh, TDD, uh, uh, so the person like us, uh, so how do you encourage and how what what principles we need to consider to start the TDD uh, for our project? Okay. Uh, where okay. to start and where to end? And mm -hmm. also it involves an estimation point. So if if I want to say my developer that to do the TDD testing uh, or my tester and have a unit testing team separately to want to do the TDD testing, what input should I give to them and uh, uh, what output I should expect from them? Okay, so uh, if someone wants to start TDD, I would say not starting with unit testing, but first is starting with a, a change in mindset. So with those developers, firstly teaching them to think test first, which is actually a big barrier. So this means that 
um, a team lead or mentor who is working with with developers might need when developers get need to implement a certain feature to sit together and together to discuss or oh, what do we expect uh, uh, our program to do i mean when we translate this requirement if we test it at the end what kind of test scenario will we have and to write that you know on paper or blackboard or something just to get the developers firstly uh, adjusted to think about tests because normally developers they think about it at the end and now it's very foreign for them to think about it at the start and this is something which i also did when i was mentoring uh, developers in the uh, company uh, after the developers for some time, whether it's a week or a month or something, become uh, familiar with talking about test scenarios before writing the code, then uh, you can move on to actually uh, writing the tests themselves. And this is the case where, okay, instead of writing the test scenario on paper or a blackboard, let's uh, write it in code. Now, I can tell you for sure when developers start, start this, it will be slow. Now, it's not slow because of TDD, it's slow because they're learning something which they've never done before in their life. Um, and in my experience, since I'm actually coaching uh, development teams, uh, it takes like three months just to get that mind shift change they get used to the mechanics of uh, both unit testing and that they are um, comfortable with thinking of tests first so it actually reduces output initially uh, in order to get the gains afterwards and this is where it really depends on the organization so is an organization prepared uh, do they have an economic interest to achieve this quality? If yes, it makes sense to, to invest in this and get the benefits later. But if the, if the organization does not see this as valuable, then they will not accept this due to the learning curve which, which occurs uh, initially. Uh, the other also problem in unit testing is uh, how to write uh, high quality unit tests. Uh, I had a separate uh, session previously, which was TDD and clean architecture driven by behavior, which shows also how, how to write effective uh, unit tests. So that's something else which maybe might be uh, useful to look at. But in any case, to summarize the answer to your question, uh, you firstly have to teach the developers to get them to think test first and then to proceed on to uh, learning okay um, by thinking test first to actually write the test first and that, that's basically i guess the short summary and yes there is a learning curve which from my experience is like three months of reduced productivity due to learning something new whether it's new uh, you know tdd or whether something else is new the other also challenge is it will uh, cause a shift in the architecture. So the architecture would need to be hexagonal architecture or a derivative like clean architecture in order for you to get uh, the most value out of unit tests. So this again triggers a much, much bigger, um, bigger trans transformation and it really depends on the organization and its values are they prepared or not not prepared not prepared to go in this direction um but in any case yeah feel free i'm interested in hearing more about how things go for you so feel free to also send uh, uh, i guess any message or or linkedin uh, maybe this could be a good topic for some future uh, posts about how, how to implement this in organizations which are not doing tdd uh, that's that will be really helpful going forward. Uh, and and if you could share the previous uh, uh, discussion, what you had on 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 uh, the development of uh, TDD, that will be great. You know, uh, so the people like us, uh, uh, you know, can learn about it and uh, educate our team to excel uh, uh, in the delivery. Uh, 
Yes, yes. So sounds good. Again, feel free. Please send me a connection invite since I, I won't have the list of participants after this meeting ends. Uh, and then maybe I can send some additional uh, follow-up info and uh, and see which future articles to write about these topics for technical managers, for example. Uh, cheers. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Anyone else has questions? OK, I have a question. Uh, so far, we have been talking about unit testing and TDD. Uh, does TDD apply to other kind of testing, like <laughs> testing or yes, interface oh, okay. modules? OK, that's a really good question. Uh, sometimes people think that TDD automatically means unit testing or unit testing only. Now, TDD in its definition only specifies the tests are written before the code, but it does not specify what kind of tests. So this means we might have uh, unit tests which run in isolation in memory, or we may have integration tests when we're testing with the database, or we may have wider uh, system or like end-to-end -end, uh, uh, tests. And TDD does not specify which type will be used, but the reason why uh, you, why um, it's preferred most tests to be unit tests is because unit tests provide the fastest, they are cheapest to write and provide the fastest feedback. But it's not just unit tests. Uh, uh, development teams need to also write uh, integration tests. So this means when we're integrating with database, we would firstly write the integration tests and then write the code to make the database work. So again, that's test driven, but just with integration, uh, with integration tests. So to summarize uh, the answer, test driven development does not specify what kind of tests someone should do, but in order to get the fastest feedback, someone should prefer most tests to be unit tests and a small percentage to be uh, integration or system tests. Yeah, thank you for that. It's clear. Uh, yeah. One more question I had from one of your last slides. Uh, you spoke about mutation testing. That is something new to me. So is there some kind of automation tool that mutates the code? for uh, Yes. Testing? Uh, yes, um, and in fact, uh, one of the uh, two articles which, which I referenced on the mutation testing, it, it shows uh, both an example of tool and as well as uh, example of code and, and how it can detect uh, bugs. And basically these tools for mutation testing, someone can look it up for various languages that someone uh, may be using. Uh, many people are not familiar with mutation testing, so maybe I might say a few more um, words on it. We've seen the problem of code coverage, because code coverage just tells you, is your test executing the code, but it doesn't tell you, uh, is your test, are your tests good enough? Are they verifying expectations? And with mutation testing, you can actually discover that you have missing tests or that your tests are um, bad. So just to give an example, let's say you have a requirement to implement the addition of two numbers. So you write a method and on one line you write return A plus B. And then you have, uh, for example, a single test, uh, you know, which for example just verifies um, Oh, sorry, or uh, a, a, a divided by B, for example, your, your testing division. And then you have just one test, or for example, six divide, divided by two, and you get 100% code coverage because that line of code, the single line of code is executed. But you're actually not verifying the two scenarios, like that you can uh, do division with maybe positive or positive and negative, or you can divide by zero and then when it tries to mutate parts of the code it can reveal an error or it can mutate uh, if statements it can change values of constants and basically when it does mutation 
it ex it wants your test to fail. Like it means your test can actually detect bugs. And if the tests are not failing, then this means you will have a lot of surviving mutants. So then you have to add additional tests and then you have less and less and less surviving mutants until you get to zero surviving mutants. This means that even though it tries to change your code, every time the test show the failure, so this means your tests are good. So mutation testing is focused on quality of your test, not the quality of your code, that's a separate point, but the quality of your test suit. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another question, I think, from Nicholas Rosado. Mm -hmm. Nicholas? Hi, Valentina. Um, Hi. We, we, we know that uh, TDD style uh, may impact uh, the way of refactoring, but uh, have you seen a uh, different uh, mutation score by, by applying a different TDD style? Uh, okay, are you talking about uh, classes versus mockers? Are you talking about those styles or uh, something else? Yeah, yes, uh, the result of mutation score, uh, it is different by uh, using different uh, TDD style. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, th th that's that's an excellent point. And I did do also a previous uh, presentation about TDD and um, clean architecture driven by behavior. Uh, basically, with classes style tests, uh, or the I'll just uh, one second. With classes style style tests, uh, someone is uh, not testing the interactions, but testing the final outcome. So this means someone can freely in the uh, refactoring change the implementation of of classes without breaking the the tests. Just to give you an example, let's say um, you need to implement some behavior which does some logic for, I don't know, calculating loan interest or tax rates. And the logic may be very, very, very complex. Maybe initially you put it in one class, but maybe later you decide to split it into 50 classes. Right, because I mean, refactoring from system perspective means you're free to move code from one class to another to break to break down what what calls what calls what class. If you use classes style TDD, then your test remains stable the whole time because those tests don't care about what's calling what or how many classes you have. But if you're using mocker style and writing one test per class, which is what man, many people, actually many developers are doing right now, then as soon as you decide to split that one class into 50 classes, then you've got all of those test failures. So you have to then just fix up all the tests. Uh, this is why, I mean, I now mainly do more classes style TDD because the tests are much more robust. So there's less test code, for, is what I've observed in practice, less test code, and the tests are more robust. So it's basically much more uh, economic way of uh, doing TDD. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next up, we have a question from Raja Nagendra. Well, hi. Hi. So thank you for bringing up mutation testing. I think I, I keep using the PI test ORG. Pit mutation Java. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So, so that, that's definitely, I mean, one, one live. PI yeah. test ORG. Mm -hmm. OK. OK. And beyond that, you know, you are based on your experience. Do you see that, you know, there's another definition of unit test? Uh, is it, you know, uh, becoming wider and wider by covering functional integration and, you know, through mocking uh, even uh, the specification behavior given, you know, acceptance test, you know, is the concept of unit test becoming wider? 
Okay, well, to give a bit of context history, in Martin Fowler's article about uh, unit tests, he says back in the old days of when XP started, so approximately 20 years ago, he was quoting one person who was saying there's 20 definitions of unit tests. Okay. So this means uh, historically uh, that there was already a huge uh, problem in terms of um, unit test definition. And even Kent Beck, when he wrote the I mean, original book, uh, Test Driven Development by uh, Example, he is saying, well, this is what I call a unit test, but someone else might, might not call this a unit test. Um, the problem is, uh, th there were different interpretations. So the older interpretations from like the days of Fortran was the unit test meant testing like um, a function. And um, now those kind of tests is basically where people had a lot of um, bad experiences. A lot of test code and your tests break as soon as you rearrange the classes. Uh, when we move uh, unit testing to a more social unit test definition, whereby the span of the unit test becomes better, uh, wider, uh, you get more robust tests, and then your unit tests actually start looking as acceptance tests. Uh, that's the kind of actual unit testing that I'm doing at the moment. So I use uh, a clean architecture. And I have a layer of use cases. And I write unit tests only targeting the use cases and not the domain entities inside. So this might, means that my tests are almost direct representations of the requirements from the business. So they serve, they run in memory but they also serve as essentially the acceptance test simultaneously. And again, this topic which, which you raised about differences in definitions, it's also something which I covered in a previous uh, meetup, uh, TDD and clean architecture driven by uh, behavior. So you can also find that uh, video by going on my uh, profile. So it was done for the, for the Switzerland Java user group and covering that, that topic. Sure, thank you. And also, yeah, uh, I mean, do we still need to enforce, you know, TDD or TLD or test anytime, you know? Why are we not enforcing, you know, test as you like, whenever you feel the need, exactly like, you know, uh, yeah, when the requirements are clear, you know, he write test case. When they're not clear, you may do some experimentation, write the main code, and then come back to, or when he's doing a refactoring and then for refactoring safety, he may get some ideas about unit testing. Mm -hmm. Is there any very strict definition still that, you know, we have to go only one way or, you know, uh, is it you know, better to know the intent of unit tests? We give that freedom for developers to decide when to write unit tests. Okay, that's a really good question. I would say start off with test class development because many developers, they're still familiar with test class development. It's more natural to them initially to learn how to even write unit tests. Then what will happen is when developers write unit tests last, they will then see that they can't write the test because the code is not testable. This might trigger some people to think, OK, maybe I should write the test first. Uh, the other point which you mentioned was about requirement clarity and waiting for all requirements to be clear. Now, I want to say one thing. The requirements will never be full, uh, fully defined, nor will the requirements ever be fully clear. Imagine business has a certain feature that they that they want to be to implement. At this moment in time, only certain things are clear, and certain other things are just future ideas. The thing which the developer is implementing, the developer must have some expectations. Uh, I'm not sure I'm hearing some background sounds. 
uh, so the developer has certain uh, expectations and those expectations they can write a test for it if they are not clear on the expectations then i will ask a bigger question not related to tests at all why are they writing a code for some logic where they don't know what what they actually expect the behavior to be that's actually the 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 bigger question and tdd actually forces you that before you write any piece of code that you need to have an expectation of the behavior and that if you don't have the expectation why are you writing uh, the code whereas in tesla's development developer might think i sort of know or maybe don't know what needs to be i will just write some code and then at the end i discover i actually have no idea what this code is supposed to do well i've just wasted a whole amount of hours in the end producing something where i have no idea what it's supposed to to do so that, that's what I actually see as, as the bigger uh, challenge. Uh, uh, last question, sorry. Yeah, so in, yeah, because you teach a lot of clean code architecture and all. So what do you protect? Is it a clean test cases or clean code? Or which is a priority for you? That's an excellent oh, question. Uh, excellent question. Many years ago, I started with clean code because look many years ago I didn't do test driven development either for me tests were just you know something at the end uh, many years ago if you asked me the, this question I would have said clean code is high priority and tests well people can learn that later now uh, since I have been doing um, I mean coaching during the past few years I actually start off with test driven development. So I ensure I only request the developers that when they're writing code that they have an expectation or that they ask a question if they don't know what, an expect, what the expectation of behavior is and to write a test for it. As for, as for code quality, I say to them, write whatever code, I don't care about code quality. I firstly want to see is this code behaving the way it should be? And I want them to get that whole test-driven discipline. After they've mastered like the test-driven uh, discipline, whether during you know, the first one or, or three months, I wanted to become natural to them. This is when my focus shifts to actually clean code. So this is where now we have a test suit. Okay, let's see. Um, how are these variables named? Uh, why is this written in like five if-else statements? Maybe we could have used polymorphism. Now that part of writing clean code, that one takes actually a uh, longer time to master. So to answer your question, uh, right now in my experience of coaching teams, I firstly put the emphasis on them learning to frame the expectations before they write code, writing code that satisfies the expectations requirements. I put that as first priority. Then after they, that becomes a habit for them, then I move more on to focusing how, how do we um, improve code. Now, I just want to also make one, one, state, one statement between TDD versus and clean architecture. If a company does decide to implement test-driven development, the architecture, uh, due to majority of tests needing to be unit tests, the architecture will need to be hexagonal architecture or a derivative of uh, like clean architecture. That's the only prerequisite. Clean code is not clean code skills are not a prerequisite. So now I actually let the developers, we gradually learn the clean clean code practices. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for that uh, clarification. Yeah, I think we are run out of time. Uh, thank you, Valentina, for being with us.
for sharing, uh, in, for giving a really good introduction to TDD and contrasting it with uh, TLD. More than this introduction, uh, I really enjoyed all the insights that you gave from uh, your ex experience with the industry. So I'm sure uh, most of the people on the call would have benefited from this. Uh, so now it's up to us uh, to go, go ahead and start uh, changing our mindset, start thinking of development in terms of TDD. So good luck to everyone. Uh, thanks again yes. to Alpina for uh, being with us today. Yes, I, I want to say th thanks a lot. And I really enjoyed uh, this discussion and all of these really great questions uh, from, from everyone. So I really hope that, that we can continue um, these discussions in, in the future. These are really yeah e excellent topics. Um, and thanks again to everyone for, for your uh, interest in, in these topics.